Our guest on This is America and the World is the ambassador of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, Masood Khan. Ambassador Khan formerly served as Pakistan's permanent representative to the United Nations, Pakistan's ambassador to the People's Republic of China, and spokesperson for Pakistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We met at the Embassy of Pakistan in Washington. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for your hospitality. Good to be with you today. Thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's a privilege to talk to you because PBS is a known and prestigious television network all over the world. So it's a privilege to be talking to you. So um, let's talk about Pakistan right now. We've just had hurricane, uh, devastation, death, displacement, destruction. You've had the floods in Pakistan. When you put those two side by side, what comes into your mind, what comes into your heart? The hurricane in Florida has been devastating, and it has proved that uh, even if you are a developed country, the most develop developed country like the United States of America, uh, you have the same challenges when it comes to climate change. Mm. And uh, in Pakistan, of course, uh, we had these uh, floods, the most devastating in our history, and uh, we we're calling them deluge, we are calling them biblical floods, mm. so they are, they've been very deadly. And in fact, as I speak to you, uh, one third of our country is underwater. Uh, waters are receding, but uh, not quickly enough. So uh, you can imagine, I mean, there are 33 million people who have been affected directly. Mm. And out of them, um, nine million, nearly nine million are internally displaced. Mm. Um, and they do not have shelter, they are waterborne diseases. Uh, roads, houses, hospitals, schools, all have been washed away, destroyed. So uh, it is a disaster of epic proportions. Mm. You know, we had uh, uh, an earthquake in 2005. Mm. It was a devastating earthquake. Then we had floods in 2010. And uh, since then, we've been preparing this uh, preparedness and response mechanism um, and uh, it has been working effectively for the past several years. This year, too, we were prepared uh, for uh, an increase in rainfall uh, to the extent of 15 to 20 percent. But the cumulative increase was about 190 percent. So we, our system was not ready to um, uh, cope with the situation. Mm -hmm. You talked about Florida, um, the fatalities in Florida have been uh, less comparatively. I mean, they have already crossed mm -hmm. the number of 100. Mm -hmm. But you had a resilient infrastructure. Uh, and uh, your event, I mean, the event in the United States and Florida, adjoining states, mm -hmm. other disasters that have been taking place in different parts of the United States during this year, um, uh, they have proved that climate-induced catastrophes can ruin your economy. So you force people to start from scratch. This mm. is what has happened in Pakistan. I mean, for these 33 million people, uh, they will have to rebuild all over again. And there's no guarantee that uh, once they have uh, built their infrastructure, there wouldn't be any other extreme weather event in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but uh, what I want to emphasize is that yes, I mean, uh, preparedness was our responsibility, and we were moving in that direction. But uh, this is a climate-induced um, disaster. You know, this year we started with forest fires, then there were multiple heat waves, mm -hmm. then there was this massive uh, glacial melt. You know that in Pakistan, uh, we have the largest number of uh, glaciers outside the polar region. They started melting, and then there were two depressions, one in the Bay of Bengal and the other in the Arabian Sea, and the result was these torrential monsoon rainfalls. Yeah. And uh, then, of course, there was this biblical deluge uh, that we faced, the people of Pakistan, and it has crippled the entire territory of Pakistan. Of course, mm -hmm. I mean, the upper parts are functional, but you know, and the southern parts have been devastated uh, so badly, 
it affects uh, every aspect of our national life. Mm. Climate change, do people get it? I mean, where is Pakistan in the conversation? Do, do you have a seat at the table? Are you being listened to? We have a seat at the table. I mean, we we associated with the, the COP process. We were very active at COP26. We would be actively participating um, at uh, COP27. Those initials or that uh, word you're using, what does that mean? That means yeah. that these conferences on climate change, as okay. a matter of put in simple words. Yes. Uh, so uh, the last one was in Glasgow. The next one would mm -hmm. be in Egypt. So uh, yes, and we are heard out. We were heard out this time as well. But then there are some ideological differences between uh, climate deniers and uh, those who think that climate is, a, is an existential threat to humanity. Add to that uh, this debate about loss and damage. I mean, if uh, Pakistan has contributed, uh, according to Jeffrey Sachs, if we, we have contributed less than uh, 4%, uh, no, less than 0.4% to global emissions, and we're paying this heavy price, this is not fair, this is not just. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are countries, I mean, the Western countries, the industrialized countries, in fact, uh, they have contributed more than 90% uh, to uh, CO2 emissions or this uh, global warming. So I think that uh, we have a collective responsibility here. Uh, you know, if Pakistan becomes a victim uh, of climate change, it could be another country tomorrow. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And it could be developed countries. Developed countries have better infrastructure. Um, so the solution is that uh, uh, we should be moving towards for, for collective solutions for humanity. Uh, you can't sort of divide different countries into islands, uh, that one island would remain secure and the other would remain vulnerable to mm. uh, climate catastrophes. We are it, one world, huh? One world, shared responsibility. Let us take a little break, Ambassador. Uh, tell the folks at home, we are at the Embassy of Pakistan here in Washington, uh, talking with uh, the Ambassador from Pakistan to the United States. Sit tight, take a little break, back on the other side. This is America and the world. This is America and the world is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. 21st Century Citizenship. The Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy. Mr. Ambassador, let us uh, finish up that, uh, that, that thought uh, about what would you need as far as assistance is concerned? Or how, how, how can... How can we help? How can the West help? Well, we're grateful to the United States of America. They've already contributed about uh, uh, $66 million for uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, we're also thankful to uh, the United States private sector, civic societies, uh, philanthropic organizations, and also Pakistani-American community for generously donating to the humanitarian assistance phase. Now, the, the uh, for rehabilitation and reconstruction, we need massive support from the international community. Mm. And uh, uh, I think that uh, the United States has indicated that uh, it would remain uh, committed for the longer term requirements of Pakistan. Um, we also want uh, uh, um, some sort of debt swap. Pakistan is indebted and I mean, if we could be given a breathing space, some moratorium, so that uh, uh, instead of uh, repayments of the multilateral debts or bilateral debts, we could invest that money for building uh, mm. climate-resistant uh, infrastructure for our people. So 
uh, here what we need is uh, one awareness raising about this catastrophe because there are yeah. many other catastrophes you have a situation in ukraine and uh, you have disasters all around the world but pakistan's is the worst natural disaster this year wow. and so we would need your continued attention and continued support uh, stepping back uh, people in america don't know much about Pakistan. What are a couple of things they should know? They should know that Pakistan is a great country, that it has been a strong ally of the United States for the past 75 years, that uh, we've fought wars together, we've made peace together, we've been advocates for peace, stability, and prosperity in our region and around the world. And uh, the people of Pakistan love the United States uh, young men and women want to study in the United States. Mm. Um, uh, you, some of your uh, uh, social trends uh, are accepted readily in Pakistan. So the people in Pakistan, particularly youth, associate with the United States. And uh, uh, we are uh, good people. Uh, Population? Uh, 220 million. 220. Uh, out, of, out of which uh, 130 million are below the age of uh, uh, 30. Our median age is 22. So Ooh. it's a young population. Uh -huh. It's a young country. <laughs> uh, major cities, uh, Islamabad, of course, the capital, right? It's, it's a, um, Islamabad uh, is the capital. It's a beautiful capital. And uh, it's a newly built, I mean, relatively newly built capital. Then you have the ancient city of Lahore, uh -huh. which has culture, tradition, ambiance. You go to Karachi, it's, it's a metropolis. It is, uh, it is a commercial and economic hub. We'll put a map on the screen as we're talking. Talk a little bit about the neighborhood, the neighboring countries, so people get a, a sense of that as well. Pakistan is a melting pot, as a matter of fact. I mean, uh, uh, on the eastern side, we have India, 1.3 billion people, and uh, at one point, Pakistan and India used to be one country, but in 1947, mm -hmm. Pakistan became a sovereign state. Uh, towards the north, you have Central Asia, and uh, they are custodians of uh, ancient civilizations, knowledge, science, technology, and then you have, uh, on the western side, you have uh, Afghanistan and Iran, mm -hmm. and uh, towards the south or southwestern region is the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. And then we have the extended neighborhood of uh, the Middle East, North Africa, Turkey, Europe. Uh, so as you're uh, describing, uh, so we've got India and, and Pakistan. Uh, how's that relationship nowadays? It's not good at the moment because we are not talking to each other. So what's going on? Uh, nothing is happening. In fact, I mean, India has closed doors on talks. Um, um, uh, under one pretext or the other. But Pakistan has preferred dialogue. We want that there should be some sort of communication between the two countries. And uh, uh, there are two or three issues that divide us. Uh, one is Kashmir, the right to self-determination of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, which was promised by the United Nations and which was accepted by India at some point. And uh, uh, the second is that uh, these communal questions, I think that I mean, there's this rise of extremism in India. And uh, I'm not talking about, I don't want to generalize Indians and India mm -hmm. because uh, 1.3 billion people. Uh, but uh, there's one segment there, uh, which is anti-Muslim. And that is creating problem within India. I mean, it's uh, uh, kind of making the Indian polity volatile. And it is also a bit threatening towards Pakistan because this is uh, the largest Muslim neighbor that it has. Mm -hmm. So I think, but uh, I don't want to sound um, uh, antagonistic uh, in this particular context. What we believe is that we have to live together. We have to do business together. We share uh, many values and cultural mores and traditions. So I think that the best course of action would be uh, for South Asia to prosper, that uh, we should resolve our differences. We should be um, uh, not sending messages through the media, or, uh, but sit 
across the table and try to resolve some of the issues which have divided us and, um, uh, for, for the past 75 years. You, uh, you, you are adjacent as well to Afghanistan. Yes. When you look across the border, what do you see? We have uh, a very close uh, relationship with Afghanistan because, I mean, uh, the border used to be very porous until mm -hmm. recently. And uh, we, I mean, towards the north of the country, and if you look at Afghanistan, we are the same people. We have kinship. We have mm -hmm. cultural and religious ties. So um, uh, the population of Afghans in Pakistan is sizable. I mean, whether they're Pashtuns or non-Pashtuns, you will find them in Karachi and you will find them. I'm wave after wave of Afghanistan. Uh, people of Afghanistan, they have been migrating to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. and so it's a very close relationship between the two countries. You gotta, uh, you're next door. You gotta, <laughs> next you gotta door. try to make do. How do you see the Taliban? What, 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 how would you describe the Taliban? Is it a political organization? Is it a terrorist organization? Well, uh, now it's a political organization because uh, they are uh, running a government there. They are the interim authority there. So they have a political persona. Uh, our relationship with them is uh, political and strategic. And we have maintained it over the years. But uh, I would say that uh, uh, we have been talking to them and we have been counseling them to focus on uh, three of their commitments that they made at Doha. One is inclusive governance. The other is uh, respecting the rights of women and girls. And third is uh, moving against uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I think that in some areas, we've been making progress bit by bit. We have influence, of course, I mean, uh, but uh, it's not absolute. And uh, we can talk to them. But uh, I think that if somebody uh, presumes that we have uh, 100% influence with them, that would not be true. In, uh, in Pakistan itself, uh, in our conversation, I would be remiss. Is Osama bin Laden, the fact that he was in Pakistan, is that the elephant in the living room? Did that hurt the United States' relationship with Pakistan? And where does the relationship stand today? At that moment in uh, 2011 and in the immediate aftermath, this was a potent factor, but uh, I personally believe that this has uh, faded away. And uh, uh, because there was this question about uh, uh, complicity or incompetence, mm -hmm. but I think that we didn't know about it. I mean, um, there's been a debate about it uh, and uh, uh, there was no duplicity on the part of Pakistan. Um, we have uh, given sacrifice of 80,000 people uh, in this war against terror. And uh, we had a shared objective. We had a common cause with the United States and its allies. So uh, we've been uh, steadfast in our friendship with the United States. This should not be a factor. But one thing that I want to highlight is that this... Um, uh, in the recent past, uh, both sides have moved closer to each other. They have opened new doors for uh, uh, cementing stronger ties. Uh, President Biden has led that effort. Secretary Blinken has been very forthcoming and proactive. And uh, our foreign minister was here. Our chief of army staff was here. Um, finance minister has been here. So there has been high mm -hmm. level uh, contact between the two sides. And what we're trying to do, this is very important to understand, that we are focusing on positives, not negatives. We are promoting a positive agenda between the United States and Pakistan. And this relationship should not be confined or limited to military to military uh, relationship or to just strategic objectives. Of course, the strategic objectives like uh, uh, counter-terrorism, uh, regional security, um, kind of military-to-military uh, uh, -military relationships, intelligence-to-intelligence -intelligence relationships, mm -hmm. they, are, mm -hmm. they are on the agenda. But more importantly, we must strengthen our economic ties, trade and investment, okay. energy, climate change, for instance. At, at this moment, what drives the economy of Pakistan? Quite a few things. Uh, it is, uh, of course, our agriculture, our industry, 
But uh, for me, the most important part right now, or component of our economy is uh, the tech industry. You know, I talked about young people, mm -hmm. uh, this young population in Pakistan. And in the past uh, uh, one and a half years, these uh, startups, tech startups, they have earned about one and a half billion dollars. This is a small amount, but uh, uh, its trajectory is very, very powerful. And I think that there would be exponential growth because of uh, increasing human capital, tech-savvy population. So I would invite uh, investors from the United States to, uh, and they are, in fact, I mean, like- That's uh, the arena that you're seeking the investment? Yes. Uh, well, in uh, there are 80 uh, American enterprises already in, the, uh, in Pakistan, mm -hmm. and they're making good money uh, there. And they are providing employment to 120,000 people, and they're supporting uh, half a million households. Uh, and they've been there. I mean, these are top brands, multinational corporations, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, Abbott, Philip Morris, uh, Cargill. They're all there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have uh, uh, positive experience. They have found Pakistani market very lucrative. But when we talk about the new areas, uh, uh, tech industry should be on the top mm -hmm. uh, because of increasing human capital that we have. And there are many uh, uh, venture capitalists here in the United States which are supporting that industry. So I think that I'm inviting uh, the US entrepreneurs from San Francisco, from the Bay Area, Pakistani Americans to invest in Pakistan because Pakistan would become a hub, tech hub, not just for Pakistan, but also for the Gulf region, Middle East, and North Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, West Asia and Central Asia. I would be, uh, I, I want to take advantage of your expertise in the area of nuclear diplomacy. Sure. There are eight countries that have nuclear weapons, uh, eight and a half, if you want to count as real. Yes. Uh, Pakistan, India both have nuclear weapons. 90% of the nuclear weapons are owned by now Russia and the United States. When Putin is talking about using nuclear weapons and Kim Jong-un is firing missiles across Japan, what what, what, what can you help us with? What, could, what should we be thinking about? What should we understand as a person who's led Pakistan's seat at the table of a UN-led summit on nuclear weapons? Well, I would say that nobody, nobody should talk about using nuclear weapons. These weapons are for deterrence. Uh, they should not be used at all because it's... it's uh, when you use uh, nuclear weapons, you are committing suicide. They are for uh, uh, establishing equilibrium, balance of power. Um, but once uh, uh, they are used, uh, then you, you would have uh, havoc you've seen never before. Um, it would be Armageddon. Imagine um, some countries using nuclear weapons they would uh, um, usher in a nuclear winter, for God's sake. And you, I mean, we were talking about uh, uh, crops washed away in Pakistan. There'd be no crops left. There'd be, uh, there would be smog this, the, all around the world. I mean, this lethal, toxic smog they would, that would kill people. So this would, be, this would be mother of all catastrophes if nuclear weapons were used. I think that we should, uh, all countries all around the world, particularly the ones who have nuclear weapons, they should uh, demonstrate restraint and responsibility. Uh, they should, uh, um, uh, they should just demonstrate stewardship. Uh, and the stewardship means that you, 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 you do not make statements regarding using nuclear weapons. So if you sat down and you were across from uh, Putin, you'd say the same? Well, I won't have that opportunity. 
Uh, and since it's a, it's a hypothetical situation, it almost uh, sounds melodramatic, I would say that uh, uh, I would counsel everybody not to talk about use of nuclear weapons or threaten to use nuclear weapons, because that can also be very, very destabilizing. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. For information about This Is America in the World, visit our YouTube channel, This Is America TV. Visit our website, thisisamerica.net, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. You can listen to all of our Ambassador interviews on our podcast, The Ambassador Series. It's available on our website and iTunes. This is America and the World is made possible by the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C. The Republic of Uzbekistan. The Sultanate of Oman. The Kingdom of Morocco. 21st Century Citizenship. The Frank Islam and Debbie Dreisman Foundation. The Forerunner Foundation. The Rotondaro Family Trust. And the Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy.